Here we are. Welcome to Breaking Dimension. to listen this is working all right yep yeah. yeah. uh, cheers Cameron and thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to talk so I'll talk a little bit about what we've been up to over the last couple of years and so the first thing was a pilot study uh, which we carried out and completed in 2009 and the uh, purpose of this was to assess tolerability in a mock MR environment before we threw anyone into a, into a potentially quite daunting uh, MR situation MR being, being the scanner. Um, and so it gave us an opportunity to assess uh, the dose, to get the correct dose to do this, and also to look at tolerability issues that uh, subjects wouldn't panic in that quite constrained, claustrophobic, potentially claustrophobic environment. So that's what we did in 2009, and that exercise gave us some confidence. The drug was well tolerated in this situation, and it allowed to go, us to go into the scanning situation with some reassurance really. And so in 2010, last year, we completed uh, our first fMRI study and that involved ASL. And ASL is essentially, it's perfusion fMRI, so that means it's, it's measuring changes in blood flow in the brain. And there's a re relatively reliable coupling between changes in blood flow in the brain and changes in neural activity. So we can draw relatively reliable inferences about changes in neural activity from the changes in blood flow that we see with ASL. So that was completed in 2010, and I'll talk about the results. And just recently, actually on Friday, we completed uh, a second fMRI study, um, and that was using the classic bold signal of fMRI, which is a surrogate index, again, of neural activity, but a more, more sensitive index than, than changes in blood flow. And you can do more with the, with the bold signal as well. You can look at something called functional connectivity, spelt wrongly there, there's always something. Um, and, uh, and you can also look at brain activations. So uh, in a block design, for instance, you can look at activations to, to different stimuli. So that, that's completed. I'll talk about the functional connectivity results, hot off the press. Okay, so this was the design for the arterial spin labeling study. Two milligrams was the dose IV that we found was well tolerated yet produced uh, relatively strong um, subjective effects. They compare using the standard altered state of consciousness questionnaire of, of Dietrichs. Uh, they compare to about 10 to 15 milligrams orally. So not of the same magnitude that Roland Griffiths is using, but um, it's been described as a moderate dose. So you don't really get these profound mystical experiences. It can happen. It's something that can happen, but it certainly doesn't invariably happen. So at this dose, the experience is more primarily perceptual, really, um, but still quite, quite dramatic, and our volunteers have had quite profound experiences. So with the study involved 15 healthy volunteers, all had previous experience with hallucinogens. There was 10 males, 5 females, with a mean age of 34. It was a single-blind placebo-controlled design within subjects, so all volunteers first had a saline, a placebo scan, 18 minutes long, and followed by a psilocybin scan. Obviously, we couldn't have the psilocybin scan first because of con contamination issues with, the, with the, the second placebo scan. So the condition was eyes open, task-free rest. They simply were instructed to lay there as still as they could, and they had a, a, a fixation cross that they were told to uh, look at in a relaxed manner. So this is our first data from actually from the pilot study, but this was a useful 
exercise not just for dose finding and tolerability, but it also allowed us to take regular subjective ratings of the intensity of the drug effects. And with that, we could map a time course of the subjective effects, and you can see how rapid they are. So at two milligrams, the 60 second infusion, you can see there in the, in the bottom left, uh, by the end of the infusion, they're already starting to feel effects. So that's, that's really quite uh, remarkable. It's quite, uh, you know, really rapid onset straight from normal waking consciousness, really close to peak after the first minute into psychedelic consciousness or the psychedelic state. So that uh, exercise allowed us to, to model uh, the data it, using fMRI. You always need a model to try and fit the data to or to compare the data to. So that, uh, that time course was useful in that respect. This is just to give you an idea of the typical uh, kind of experiences people were having. The items of about 25 were used, adapted from Dietrich scale. We were trying to look, uh, Dietrich scale wasn't really designed primarily for the psychedelic experience. It was altered states in consciousness. So it was used, uh, the background research involved cannabis, uh, altered states of consciousness and um, meditation. And, and this kind of thing. So we, we were looking, actually, you know, adapting these items to try and try and more specifically nail down the uh, prototypical effects of, of psychedelics, at least at this dose. And so the item that was rated highest was I saw geometric patterns. This is placebo in grey, so that's just something that doesn't happen ordinarily in normal waking consciousness. And I'll read these items. So I saw my surroundings change in unusual ways. Things look strange. I felt unusual bodily sensations. My imagination was extremely vivid. My sense of size or space was altered. My sense of time was altered. That's something that's highly typical of the psychedelic experience. My thoughts wandered freely. This freeing of cognition and of perception. The experience had a dreamlike quality. That's something that's interesting and may map onto the neurophysiology of, of the psychedelic state. Uh, this, uh, this comparison with the dream state and the physiology of of dreaming or, or rapid eye movement sleep. Uh, and sounds influenced things I saw. So we, we also had synesthesia commonly reported. So on to the interesting stuff. How does psilocybin change brain blood flow? So here's our, our results. And the first surprising thing, you, you'll notice that there are blue blobs on the brain and those indicate decreases in blood flow. And like a lot of people would intuit, we were actually expecting increases in blood flow. And we didn't see that at all. We didn't see increases in any region in the brain. So that was an initial surprising finding. And with it being surprising, it was interesting. It was novel. And um, this novelty, this surprise, enables you to learn. You know, We're learning from the data here. And so we're seeing profuse decreases. And they're well localized to important uh, gray matter regions subcortically in the thalamus. We've got this frontoinsular, uh, orbitofrontal, inferior gyrus region. I'll describe the function of these regions in a moment. Posterior cingulate, which is a, a key hub region in the cortex. These lateral parietal regions and a medial prefrontal region closely associated with self-reflection and the sense of self. So here's another image, a close-up of our results, the same result. Uh, the cursor lies over this posterior cingulate region, which has uh, the highest metabolism of all regions in the brain it, it actually accounts for 35% of the brain's metabolism. So it's doing something very important, and I'll, I'll talk about some of the functions that it subserves. Uh, we, you can see very nicely the uh, localization to the thalamus, the putamen, an important uh, structure of the striatum. So these were, were, were nice and surprising results for us. OK, but what does this mean? Well, like I said, this posterior cingulate region has higher than average activity during rest, during normal waking consciousness, ordinarily. And it also has disproportionately high connectivity. So it has more connections from and to this region than any other region in the brain. So people often get seduced by the prefrontal cortex and, and think uh, because of its evolutionary expansion, um, there's something especially important about it. And, and there's, of course, some, something to that. However, uh, a lot of neuroimaging data is now 
sort of shifting the focus really um, in terms of understanding consciousness and changing consciousness to this posterior cingulate region. It's been described as the mind's eye, uh, uh, sleep onset, uh, reduced consciousness, minimally conscious patients uh, all have changes of function in this region. So there is something important about this region and consciousness. And one thing I'd like to expand on, and I'll expand on throughout the talk, is that the regions that we've seen decreases in actually have you know, higher than average connectivity. So they're, they're hub nodes in the brain. And you can imagine and intuit, and it's natural to intuit, that a hub region subserves and is important for integration in the brain. So rather than have uh, separate modules doing independent things and working in an um, anarchic, uh, unconstrained manner, uh, the function of this kind of core to the brain or spine, these hub regions, is to bring things to give, together and give consciousness a, a, a unity and a cohesion. And that's something that we're learning is lost or decreased, relatively decreased in the psychedelic state, that loss of cohesion, that loss of integration, and that loss of constraint. So the default mode network, the, the hub regions are referred to as this default mode system. Default because it's a system that's always there. It has a tonically high level of activity. Uh, if you cue activations in the brain with certain stimuli, uh, you'll see a relative deactivation in this uh, system, uh, but when the, the, the stimuli are, um, when they end, the, the brain uh, activity will, will re return in this default mode uh, system, or there'll be a, a, a normalization from that relative decrease that was cued by, by attentiveness. So it's referred to as a default mode system. Tasks that generally activate these regions include introspection, uh, prospection, looking into the future. So quite high level human functions and perhaps species specific functions, our ability to have that temporal span to look into our past and learn from our past and also to use that information to prospect, to plan into the future. That's something which is, which is particularly high level and, and, and human specific, we think. So like I said, this posterior cingulate region where the cursor lies over has especially high metabolism, and that's shown there. So did the blood flow changes correlate with subjective ratings? It would add a degree of, of uh, adds, you know, make the results more compelling if this is true, and, and it was true. So there was a correlation between our most simple rating, which was just, intensity. So uh, on a VAS scale with a bottom anchor of no effects and a top anchor of extremely intense effects, we looked at correlations between changes in blood flow in the brain and these ratings. And we saw those individuals that had the most intense experiences had the largest decreases in the medial prefrontal cortex, like I said, associated with self-reflection um, in terms of it being part of a system related to the sense of self, possibly people are, are talking now that this may actually be the self itself, you know, the self will be a system in the brain uh, and, and our best guess is that the self, you and I, you know, us as agents, entities in the world and that, that sense of self that we have rests on this system, it, it, it's emergent from this brain system. So this is a close-up of that same result, and the cursor lies over the rostral anterior cingular, or part of, of a kind of general medial prefrontal cortex region. Also, we've got some frontoinsular effects and uh, the anterior thalamus. Um, these are regions which are important, as I've said before, for self-judgment, self-reflection, self-consciousness. So when self-consciousness or self-reflection is cued, and subjects in an fMRI scanner in a block design are uh, encouraged to self-reflect or to see relative activations in this region. And that's, that's quite well reproduced and specific as well, in that these activations are actually specific for contemplations of the self over just contemplation of people or others. So, uh, 
these are regions that we see a decrease in with psilocybin. And the inference, I was in, inspired really by something Andy uh, Letcher said yesterday about uh, you know, how we describe the psychedelic consciousness, the psychedelic state, um, and he referred to, to something along the lines of a, a continuous stream of uncertainty. <coughs> that had a lot of intuitive appeal for me because it maps onto ideas in, in cognitive neuroscience at the moment and systems neuroscience where we're trying to think about uh, how the brain works with reference to prediction, drawing inferences on stimuli, um, and how, how the brain also maintains the steady stream of normal waking consciousness and limits uncertainty and surprise in our exchange with our environment. And so that was an interesting uh, thing that he said, and, and I put this in last night, and it, it made a lot of sense to me, that that uh, constrained, anchored, predictable quality of normal waking consciousness is perturbed on psychedelics. And that, that continuous stream of relative certainty that we have, that we actually take for granted, um, is something which is affected by psilocybin. So our new, our new results from the Bowles study. I'll talk about our functional connectivity results. So uh, this was a balanced order design. The subjects had scans separated by roughly a week, two weeks. There was a pre-infusion baseline similar to the ASL. It's a 12-minute scan in total, and simply the infusion comes halfway through. And uh, in half, they'll get saline, in, and in half, they'll get uh, saline plus two milligrams of psilocybin. So the functional connectivity results. First, what is functional connectivity? So essentially, it's cohesion or, or correlations um, between, between the activity of spatially remote regions in the brain. So typically, the classic approach is to pick a region of interest. And here, they've cho chosen the posterior cingulate. And then you simply look for where in the brain is activity correlated or, or um, coupled or, or, um, or um, you know, in synchrony with, with that region of interest. And you can see mapped here that there's a medial prefrontal node, which is uh, correlated with the activity of the posterior cingulate. And this blue region is actually part of a system which is typically activated during attentiveness, which is uh, in an antiphase uh, relationship with, with this uh, orange network, which is actually the default mode network, and the network that we've seen decreases in blood flow in. And we've also seen decreases in functional connectivity in this network as well. So again, the cursor lies over this ventral posterior Hippocampus is the region of interest because it has good connectivity with the default mode network. And we've seen decreases in connectivity post-infusion contrasted with, with placebo as well. So these are, these are a, a double contrast versus uh, pre-infusion and versus placebo. And so we're seeing decreases in the uh, medial prefrontal cortex, posterior cingulate, got some visual effects there and other uh, parasingular uh, decreases in functional connectivity. So again, what does this mean? Well, connectivity with the hippocampus and the medial temporal regions actually correlates with temporally ori oriented thoughts. So using uh, intermittent sampling and asking what people were thinking of, uh, there is a correlation between how regular people think about uh, you know, the future, the, what's going to happen in a couple of days, what's happened last night and such like and connectivity with this default mode system. So we're actually seeing a decrease in that. So that, I'm thinking now, may map onto this loss of time that people report with psychedelics, that loss of, of uh, anchorage of the self in time and our usual uh, sense of, of the, the, the steady and consistent flow of time. So to summarise our results, we've seen decreases in the default mode network in these key regions. We've seen decreases in connectivity. Uh, these are regions with high hub um, connectivity. They're connector hubs in the brain. And the e explanation that we're going with is that we're seeing an essential loss of functional integration, a loss of, of, of cohesion um, and the sort of unifying and the holding together of, of, uh, of normal waking consciousness under psilocybin. 
So do these have clinical applications? Well, we've seen decreased in, decreased in connectivity in the default mode system. And uh, connectivity is actually uh, increased in, in depressed patients, albeit here using a different region of interest. Um, and what does that mean? This is a complicated finding. Hopefully, I'll be able to explain it to you OK. So using positron emission tomography. PET scanning and looking at binding to the serotonin 2A receptor. Uh, in, healthy, in a large sample of healthy volunteers, the higher the binding or the higher the expression of serotonin 2A receptors, the higher the incidence of neuroticism. Why would the 2A receptor be high in these individuals? You would intuit um, that it is an upregulation due to uh, low synaptic 5-HT. So the brain is always trying to find a, a homeostasis, an equilibrium, and if a synaptic 5-HT is low, then a, a postsynaptic receptor that depends really on stimulation by 5-HT serotonin will upregulate so that it, it will try and get stimulated more. Really. And so this process, this upregulation of 5-HT, 2A seems to be correlating with uh, neuroticism here, neuroticism ratings, and also with pessimism. This is in depressed patients, a small sample uh, showing a correlation with dysfunctional attitudes, which is essentially a measure of pessimism. So one inference from that is that uh, depressed patients are having de um, deficient or impoverished stimulation of the serotonin 2A receptor, and it suggests, it implies that Stimulation of the serotonin 2A receptor might be a candidate um, target for, for um, treatments for depression. So, what is uh, the classic phenomenology of depression? Well, you'd see an avoidance, often a withdrawal, a social withdrawal, and an emotional withdrawal. Self criticism is very prevalent, and this unyielding uh, uh, pessimism that you can treat the intensity of negative effects um, relatively well with uh, first line antidepressants, but this stubborn pessimism, this cognitive, negative cognitive bias that you see in depressed patients and that characterises treatment-resistant depressed patients is something which is especially difficult to treat. And that's something that potentially could be a target for uh, psilocybin or a serotonin 2A agonist. So this is, to end the talk, this is a passage from one of our volunteers. Uh, and I'll read it to you. So, ever since Thursday, I'd say I found it much easier to engage in the moment, to attend to the here and now, whether this be watching water in a fountain or sitting in science talks and meetings this morning. Um, there were some fountains in Cardiff, in Cardiff is where we were scanning, and uh, the water was being blown by the wind, allowing the sun to highlight its spray. I could have watched it for ages. The image was the same, I guess, no extras, but somehow the beauty was enhanced. Whatever it was, it, it has lasted. Like the sun shining through the leaves this morning, it made me slow down my walks, work, and enjoy the experience of it flickering over my face. So this uh, this kind of afterglow is something that we've seen uh, regularly with our volunteers, and is another kind of motivational factor for why we're contemplating now um, taking this to depressed patients, albeit in a, in a, um, in a slow and, and careful manner. Uh, just to uh, some important thanks. First of all, to um, my supervisor essentially, David Nutt. Uh, this wouldn't have happened without him. And crucially, this wouldn't have happened without uh, the support of Amanda Fielding and, and the Beckley Foundation. And I'd just like to, to emphasize that really. You know, uh, we owe a lot to Amanda and the support she's given to this research. And this is. <laughs>